switch the, the, the topic a bit. And I want to have on the one uh, part, um, I want to present you a technology which we, uh, or a project which we unfortunately had to stop 10 years ago. But uh, so there might be a, re a revival of this technology. And the, in the second part, I want to ask you to help me to interpret uh, some phenotypes. And in the third part, I want to talk a bit more about uh, mouse databases. So, but let's start with uh, my first topic. So, I think in most cases during the course, you might have heard uh, many things about uh, the, what is called the re reverse genetics. So, you come from the gene, knock it out, or do some changes in the, in the gene, and then have a look what happens to the mouse. But the classical and the forward genetics does exactly the, uh, it, uh, it other, the other way around. So, uh, for example, the, the, most, the oldest way to analyze mutations was that people just collected spontaneous mutants in mice or any species and uh, tried to find out, breed, breed them, play around with them, learn about the genetics, and finally also uh, uh, found the gene which is responsible for these mutations. As a next step, people did radiation mutagenesis to speed up the frequencies of mutations. And the, uh, the next or higher level and the more upspeeded level of mutagenesis might be chemical mutagenesis. You might have heard about um, ENU, e 2 urea as a chemical that can produce uh, mutations, in most cases point mutations, in uh, mice. Uh, and which was used uh, to produce um, mouse mutants. And this can be also used for so-called sensitized sc uh, screens. I will come back to this later in my talk. So that's what we are going for today. And we used this, kind, this chemical mutagenesis in the Munich ENU mouse mutagenesis screen, and we did this for about 10 years. And, um, Unfortunately, 10 years ago, about we had to stop up with this project. Um, and at that time, people considered it more or less as old-fashioned technology. But uh, nowadays, people come back to us and, uh, and ask whether we are thinking about uh, giving this uh, project a kind of revival. And maybe in a few years, this might be the most modern technology or something <laughs> like this. So today, you hear about maybe what will be in a few years the the up-to-date way of uh, genetic uh, analysis. And um, this project was independent from the one in the hardware? Um, it was more or less independent, but we had close collaborations with them. Okay. And uh, maybe we start just to give you an idea. So this is ENU, so normal, normally um, uh, Ura, Uria is, has a second uh, um, NH2 group right here uh, and right there and if you uh, exchange in this uh, second uh, NH2 group one with a, an E2 group and the other one with a nitroso group you have ethyl nitroso urea and this chemical can interact with DNA for example right here you have a tumidin and uh, the ethyl nitroso urea acts with uh, here with, with this uh, group right there, and this finally will result in an exchange of a tumidine to a guanine um, by replication uh, periods, and uh, that's exactly what uh, we uh, try to use. So we use male mice, in our case it was the C3H uh, genetic background, C3H, EB, FEJ, because in our case uh, the the immunologists who also contributed to the analysis in, in this project, they were quite interested in this special genetic background. The mice then are getting injected with ENU, and the ENU just goes through, through the whole body and will put mutations in all organs. The ENU is toxic, so this means um, they are sterile for about 80 to 90 days. If they are not sterile, the ENU injection did not work. That's also kind of a quality control. And um, 
the ENU also will act in the, in the spermatogonia, and this can be used for us because if the spermatogonia are mutagenized, the sperm will be mutagenized, and this means the offspring will carry mutations. And that's exactly what we do after the mice are fertile again. They are mated with wild-type C2H females. This will produce some uh, F1 animals, and a fraction of them will show phenotypic variations. For example, in this case, a kinky tail. And now the question is whether the phenotypic vari variant is really a genetic mutation-based variant, or it's just a, a somatic mutation, whatever happened with the mouse, or it's, uh, in the case of the kinky tails, it's, a, um, it's just hurt by, by, by somebody. And uh, so we have to do a genetic confirmation, and that's quite easy. We just breed this uh, phenotypic variant to another wild-type animal, and as these animals, if they carry a mutation, have to be heterozygous, because the mutated allele from the male, um, one can be, only one allele can be from the, from the mutation, the other one is from, from the uh, female. Uh, this means if there are a fraction of 50% again show the, uh, the phenotypic variant we have seen in the F1 animals, then we can consider this uh, animal as a mutant. And uh, then we can backcross this again and again because the ENU uh, will put many uh, mutations in the background, so we have to get rid of all the other mutations and just have the one mutation in, in, the, in the strain which, did, um, which caused the, the kinky tail in, in this uh, example. But for sure, one might be also interested in recessive alleles. That's also possible with this technology. So we again start with a wild-type male. The male is again injected with ENU, then mated to a wild-type female. And the F1 generation then um, does, uh, would not show any phenotype, because now we are interested in the, in the recessive alleles. Um, we mate only the males um, with uh, females, with wild-type females, and produce a G2 generation. And uh, this G2, G2 generation might be a mixture of uh, heterozygous and wild-type animals, so we have to expand this colony to, uh, to produce really homozygous. And then, for sure, we have to. We only can can uh, continue with uh, with females because uh, we want to backcross these animals with their father right here. And uh, this uh, this um, cross will now result in a fraction of animals which might be homozygous for the mutation which comes from this ENU uh, injection. And these animals now uh, the G G3 generation might show a variant phenotype, and there again we have to prove that this phenotype is really uh, according to, uh, to a mutation caused by the ENU. So we again have to think about how we can confirm this. There are several strategies. We can go either back across to the grandfather or grandmother, um, or we can breed them again to, uh, to a wild type animal and intercross the, uh, which might uh, then be heterozygous, and intercross the, the offspring of this breeding, and find again whether there are in the next generation uh, mice showing the phenotype, and then we can consider that these animals are uh, real mutants. We did this. One, one question sure. to the previous one. In, in this case, you are taking the one only males, so you are missing, uh, losing all the potential mutations in the X chromosome. Yes, exactly. But that's al already... Uh, this you, you have another pipeline for them? Uh, so, no, the, so the X chromosome cannot be mutated because even in the... Uh, even in the dominant screening, you might... you won't see any mutations in the X chromosome because 
um, the X chromosome always has to come from, from, the, fe uh, from the wild type female, even right there. Because if you get um, the, the, this male um, will all in, I don't know, you're right. There, there are pot potential, yeah. the females can carry, uh, yeah, can can carry, carry the, the, the X chromosome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but in, in the recessive screen, uh, we don't see any, okay. uh, any uh, X uh, chromosomal changes. Good. So we did this and we analyzed about uh, um, 42,000 uh, mice for in the dominant screen and uh, 6,700 mice in, in the recessive screen, so it re represents 412 families. Uh, we found in total 736 uh, confirmed mutants, and at that time we even licensed out uh, 92 of these mutant lines. Just uh, to, uh, as I was responsible for the dysmorphology screen, there is a, an overview about the different phenotypes and the numbers uh, we, we saw in right there, for example, mice with a trembling phenotype, with a uh, teeth phenotype, skin and hair phenotype, limbs, eye, deafness mutants, coat color, uh, bone mutants. Uh, this can be either um, morphological or even metabolic bone mutants, uh, body size, uh, abnormal behavior. And uh, maybe we just have a look at the, the skin and hair mutants where, for example, you can see different, so this is a, a wild type uh, pole of a, a C3H mouse, and you can see right here different uh, variations of mutations which uh, contribute to a darkening of, of the skin of the animals. And uh, our screen contributed to the landscape of uh, mutations for pigment um, uh, mutations contributed a wide range of all these uh, additional uh, phenotypes. And also for the bone, we had the mice with the pattern and defects, with growth and mineration, with remodeling, uh, with the, the aging and immune system with the, with the bone, uh, which we contributed with the screening. But this technology can be also used to find modifiers for your uh, special gene. For example, we again start uh, with injecting male animals uh, with uh, ENU, but now we don't mate them to wild type females, but to heterozygous, in our case, uh, Delta 1 mutants. Uh, but you can do this with all loci you are interested to find modifiers. And then we found phenotypes. Uh, in the offspring, and we just have a look at the ones which are again heterozygous for, for the delta locus. And if we conf can confirm that the phenotype is only present uh, in offspring uh, with, a, with a delta mutation, then we have found uh, potential modifier genes uh, that uh, will uh, uh, interact with the delta locus. And this is the plan how the mice were, were tested. So, um, for sure, the more uh, phenol or areas you, you check the mice, the more chance you have that you find uh, mut um, phenotypes that, that are based on, on the pot uh, potential mutations in these animals. But for sure, the one thing is uh, to produce mutants, but the next step is also to find the gene which is responsible for this mutation. And that's uh, what I want to show you in the next few slides. So the way would be, have a mouse with a special phenotype, um, find the chromosome uh, on which uh, this, uh, geno, uh, this mutation is located, and then you can go for sequencing and uh, find the mutation. So how to, uh, maybe a first a definition for everybody who is not familiar with the, the, the term centimorgan. So centimorgan, uh, is equal to uh, unit uh, to one percent recombination frequency, and in mouse this means about uh, a distance of two megabases. I think in human it's it's one, and in, in mice it's two. Yeah. So, how to proceed this? 
So um, let's consider we have a mouse, just uh, for example, with uh, with with a uh, red uh, circle on on the on the neck. Uh, this mouse is uh, on a C3H genetic background, so now we take a mouse on a different genetic background, for example a black 6 mouse. We produce offspring from this mouse. We just select the ones which show the phenotype. And uh, this, the mice with the phenotype again are mated to uh, another black 6 animal, wild type black 6 animal. And then uh, we again have a fraction of 50% animals showing uh, the, the phenotype and 50% without phenotype. And, uh, but let's have a look what happens on the chromosomal level of, of these animals. Let's say this is the, the wild type chromosome. This is uh, right here, there's the mutation of the animal. Now let's mate it to a black 6 animal. I hope you can see that this is orange and th this is red. Bit difficult to see on the on the screen, so this means the the chromosomes from the black six are in general uh, different from the ones from C three H. We mate them, and we happen to see okay, there are wild type animals heterozygous, and there are uh, the the mutant animals heterozygous showing right there the the black six chromosome and the C three H with the mutation. We made them again with black six, the orange one, and find again heterozygous animals uh, that show the phenotype and uh, another uh, fraction of the animals which don't show the phenotype. But as at this point uh, recombination can start in the animals, we just we don't have only uh, a pure C3H and a pure black six chromosome, but we also have a series of additional chromosomes um, with mixtures. So uh, a long part of the C3H and and uh, a small part of, of the, the black six, and or just right there part of the the uh, black six and the rest is, is C3H, and wherever it's just more or less depending on, on the, the chromosome random, the part where, where the crossing over occurs. But what is typical to all the mutants and typical to all the wild type animals that right there on this part of the chromosome, the mutants are C3H and the, the mice showing the wild type phenotype have the part for, uh, from the chromosome from the black 6 mice. And if I now go with SNP mark markers on the different chromosomes, uh, I just have to find out where's the linkage to the C3H part of the chromosome, and then I know exactly this is my chromosome, and then I can, uh, can go there for, for the um, sequencing. So uh, if the, the numbers are not perfectly fitting, you can, can test this, for example, with a, a simple uh, chi-square test and, and find uh, the chromosome where is the linkage. There are also some uh, estimations how far apart uh, the, the linkage um, is on the chromosome, but I don't want to go into the details about this. You can find this in, in textbooks. As a next step, we also can have a look about the... the um, the mapping of, for example, um, recessive alleles. Sorry, one more thing. In any case, in the previous case in which the, the trait was dominant, door was dominant, yeah. uh, you still make up very large pieces of DNA to, to analyze because you are doing such very simple crosses and, may, uh, let's say, distance. You, you mentioned one centimeter and it's two million of bases. So there, then, you, mm -hmm. what you do? You do sequence of this part to identify the gene because you may still have many genes in, mm -hmm. in, in the area. Yeah. So uh, you have different possibilities. On the one hand side, nowadays, sequencing a large DNA uh, fragment is not as, yeah. as expensive anymore. Uh, uh, 
at times where where you you uh, have to to really put um, have have small pieces of DNA for sequencing, you can can uh, go put the markers and refine the area of your um, of your linkage more and more and find markers which are closer and closer. Just doing more breeding. Uh, that you have two two possibilities: two more breeding because. Um, it depends on the number of animals. The, uh, the more um, um, rearrangements you have on the chromosome in this critical area, for sure, if you are lucky, you find uh, yeah. a linkage right there and a linkage right there and you're yeah. perfect. And you just need a, a number of markers which, uh, which really cover this area and you're perfect. But the more animals you breed, the more animals you will find with, link, uh, with a crossing over event in, in this critical region. And the, the narrower you can can come to to a critical region, and uh, then you either get for candidate genes, uh, or you you uh, you just sequence the, the yeah, critical region. That you know that yeah. in this region you yeah. make up three four candidate genes, and exactly. you look for the mutation in these genes. Exactly, exactly. Which one You can do whatever marker you like. So you just need markers that are polymorphic between the black 6 and the C3H. Because you, you have to know uh, whether uh, the mouse is, uh, um, uh, carries the black 6 or the C3H allele at the, that position. So that can be microsatellites, you can use SNPs. So, yeah. so let's come back to, uh, to the recessive allele. So here again, we have our recessive mutant, um, homozygous mutant. We cross them to black 6. Um, then the offspring are heterozygous. And uh, in this case, we don't go back to the black 6, but we intercross these uh, F1 uh, animals. Uh, and the result in uh, about 25% of animals that show the, uh, the phenotype. 75% might be heterozygous or wild type. Uh, without phenotype, and if we again have a look at the chromosomal level, you can see now they are homozygous, we breed them to, to the orange black 6. Um, the offspring are heterozygous, and now uh, there can be um, crossing over events on, uh, on the part of this animal, as well as in the, in the part of this animal. So this means here you double the crossing over number already in the F1 generation, and uh, Again, you can see that the, oops, sorry, that for uh, for the 25% uh, mice with the phenotype, you again have all them which showing the phenotype should be homozygous at the mutation area uh, for the C3H, <coughs> and all the others are either heterozygous or homozygous for the um, uh, for for the black six allele right there. Okay, um, so as I told you, the project has been stopped about 10 years ago, but what we did is we collected um, sperm samples uh, from, from all the, the male uh, um, variants, and we collected uh, uh, DNA samples from these animals, and what can be done is we can go back to these uh, 16,800 samples and uh, we can sequence them for a gene of interest and find whether there are mutations in these animals and then directly from the sperm have the mutant mouse uh, resurrected and, and uh, can use it for our um, analysis. So this is still in place and this might be also part of a potential revival of this project. So now let me come to the second part of my presentation. And uh, here I want to have an interaction with you. So now you are the phenotyper. You check <coughs> the mice and tell me what is wrong with my mouse. A first example, this one. It's quite easy to see what happens to this mouse. Yeah, so there's a pigmentation right there, even right there, even the fur. So this was a, a C3H mouse, because I told you this was done in, in C3H background. 
this coat color is, is, is much brighter than expected in a, in a, as in a wild type C3H mice. By the way, what is this? Yes. Exactly, so this is a, a sperm sample for, for mice. Next example, this one is the wild type. Yeah, obese, okay. Quite simple. <laughs> what about this mouse? <laughs> it's a curly tail. Okay. So these are the easy examples. I don't want to have a freak show, but so it's really to 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 learn about uh, where to where to have a look at the mice. So what about this mouse? Uh, yeah, it's the the right direction. But what is real, the real change in this mouse? Hmm? Maybe I, I show you the wild type just to, to compare it. Yeah, so every, I think everybody looks right there, right? So, but what is the correct term? Maybe you, you might see it better if you did, did an X-ray from this mouse, because this is a polydactyly. You can see right here, right here, which looks a bit, so for, for our eyes it looks shorter, but the, the size is normal, but uh, so there is another uh, another digit coming out, and if you do an X-ray, you can really see that there is a bone behind this uh, this digit. Another example. <laughs> what about this mouse? No. I, I show you the the wild type for comparison. Uh, no, so it should be a morphological change. All the, the maybe the, the the different way of of, uh, of positioning might be because uh, somebody had to to hold the mice for the photo. So I think you might consider this right there, and you might consider this digit right here. So this one is, is shorter, and you can see right here uh, a, a sort of syndactylism in the, in the animals. Does everybody agree? <laughs> <laughs> so this is really something you have to, to really observe the mice very, very carefully. But you can see that there, the digit starts right here, and there is still some, some skin which is not present in, in this uh, mouse right here. Is this type of effect are present in non four link? Uh, or just in some length? So it's, uh, in most cases you see, you see it uh, more obviously in, in the hind limbs, and the, the front limbs sometimes uh, also show a smarter phenotype or no phenotype. If you breed them to, to homozygosity, you will see that this digit is, is missing, completely missing. So this is a heterozygous uh, mutant. So now a different mutant. This is the wild type, this is the mutant, just for your information. Any ideas? Maybe more length. Uh, yeah, may, maybe, but this is also due to the, the fact that the, we, we had to hold the, them for, for the image, and the, this one is a bit moving, stretched to. <laughs> no, not really. The problem is also to take a picture like this, you need age matched animals. And it's not so easy to find exactly a mouse which is the same age and, and uh, uh, comparable in, in, uh, in size. This is not the case in this mutant. Any ideas? Yeah, what is, what is, what is going on in the tail? Perfect, very good. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, but what is easier to see in the tail compared to this one? It seems faint because it's No, no. maybe we, we even <laughs> should switch off the light right there then. <laughs> then it's even better to see. Ah, and now it's much better. Yeah, perfect. So you can see right there the tail. Is, uh, is much darker pigmented and also if you have a look at the ears you can see that there are much darker ears in these animals and if you have a look at the paws they're even black you remember the, the image I showed you with the different um, uh, skin color uh, mutations so this is one of, of them and you can see it's not only the, the paws affected but also the, the ears and the tail so now right here, um, you can also already see osteogenesis imperfecta, but the question is, which one is the mutant, which one is heterozygous, which one is homozygous, and which one is the wild type? <laughs> so let's ask, who, who says that the, this one is the wild type? Hands up. <laughs> Okay. Uh, votes for the middle one. And votes for the right one. Okay. So who voted for the left one? So you are right. This is the wild type. <laughs> so when, whenever you, you have a mice in your hands, open up the mouth and have a look at the teeth. And the upper incisors, they are always red, because this is uh, some accumulation of, of, uh, um, of iron right here. So that's a kind of, uh, um, uh, of resource of, of iron right there. And uh, you can see right here, this is the heterozygous mice. They, uh, they, they are white, uh, and uh, they have a problem in, uh, in uh, the ameloblasts that pr produce the... Um, um, the dentine, and uh, right here you can see in the homozygous animals it's completely completely lost, which is not a problem for the mice, uh, because the mice in the mice the, the teeth still grow and grow and grow, but uh, in the humans if you have patients with osteogenesis imperfecta, in the age of 30 years uh, they have completely lost uh, their teeth. Okay. Another example? Are you tired? <laughs> What's wrong with this mouse? So it's not the light. Uh, no, so this is just because somebody has to, <laughs> to hold the mouse. Uh, no, no. Uh, no, so that's wrong. But uh, if you have a look at the eyes, uh, so this is not because of the light, this is a real cataract. And uh, so uh, in most cases cataracts are, are quite hidden and you need to, uh, to, to have a close look with, the, for example, with a slit lamp. Uh, but in this example, you can see it with, with your naked eye uh, in the mice. <clears throat> Another example, that we need a video. <coughs> oh yeah, it works. What's wrong with this mouse? Problem with the movement. Which kind of movement? Like... Uh, Korea hunting for movement, something like that, not control the one. Yeah, exactly. And so the, the most important one was uh, this, this kind of head shaking behavior. You can mm -hmm. see, so uh, for sure, if mice explore, they, they look around, but they never do it like, like this. <coughs> they, they do it slowly. And uh, so this is a... a an example of, of many mutants we had, uh, where we had problems uh, with, the, uh, with the inner ear problems, so either with hearing or with balance defects, 
and uh, that's uh, there are many different ways of, of this kind of phenotypes. Some of them are circling around. Some of them show a very wild, mild phenotype. This is a very quite strong phenotype of this head shaking. Another example. If you are tired, just let me know. You can stop. So, one is wild type, one is mutant. Did you see any chain differences? Yes, like a tremor from the, the one on the left. Like a ripple like the male pattern. Uh, and also no. the behavior, something like that. Okay. One is much more curious than the other one, no? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so I can tell you this one is the wild type. And this one is, is the mutant. I, I will show you the, the video again. And did you see? The right one did something. Uh, you might have to know that the... Uh, I'll tell you. Have a look at the right one. Now? Kind of shaped. Yeah. And so this was uh, uh, due to a uh, machine we used, which is called a click box. And the click box is, used, is a, a simple test for hearing of the animals. So I can show you the next video, how it looks like. So this is a click box, and you press a button as a researcher, and then there a sound of 20 kilohertz will come out. And these 20 kilohertz, for, our, for us humans, it's a borderline for hearing. You are still young, you might be able to hear it. I heard it when I was 20 years younger, now I'm <laughs> not able anymore to hear it. But for mice, this is a, a, a very unliked sound. And uh, so what they do is they react with a so-called prayer reflex. So they, uh, they startle and they even flip back the ears somehow. I can show you. Once, twice. And if you go now back to this example right here. So both of them hear the sound, but only this one reacts and this one is completely deaf. So this one did not react at all. OK. You want to do more examples? <laughs> so let's come to x-rays. What is wrong with this mouse? Yeah, so this is a quite, quite old mouse. So, and uh, C3H mice are always a bit more, uh, more uh, stronger than, than uh, Black 6. But I think it's quite obvious. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. So the, this is the, the mouse I showed you before with the curl tail. And here you can see this. Unfortunately, it's a bit difficult, but if you would count the number of ribs and vertebrae, you, then you would see that uh, the number of uh, rib vertebrae uh, uh, is changed uh, in these animals. Uh, so normally you have 12, and there are 13 and 7, and there should be 6. But it's really difficult, and I have to admit that I am not any more as experienced as I was some years ago. So I have to rely on my own pictures. <laughs> okay, what's wrong with this mouse? So this is really the most uh, challenging part. <coughs> Maybe you have a look at this area right there. Hmm? No, no, just have a look at the bones. No, in this case not. Uh, no. <laughs> Maybe have a look at right here, and I can show you yes, the one. Uh, here, uh, something additional. So, uh, or let me show you. So have a look right there. 
and uh, go back to the before one. You can see that there is uh, the part where the muscle uh, attached. is attached. And if you have a look right there, it's missing. That's also why the muscles are quite weak right there on these animals. And you would, if you have a close look right there, there are some calcifications at the areas where the ribs come out. And also the clavicle, if you have a look at the mouse before, it's not really, not really existing right there. But so this is really difficult to see. Last example. Where? Uh, in Greece. Yeah, you mean right there? Yeah. So perfect. Yeah. So it's not a calcification, it's, it's a, a, a change of, of the vertebrae. So they are mal, malformed. And if you follow the vertebral column, there's a, a, a change. And right there again. And like there. Okay, good. So that's all my examples, but I think now it's, it's enough <laughs> examples. <laughs> uh, oops, sorry. On the last part, I want to address mouse databases. As you heard yesterday, uh, we are doing large scale experiments, also, this ENU experiment was a large-scale experiment and this means you have to handle thousands of animals at once and you have to know exactly which mouse is which mouse and so you don't have to start with Excel or something like this to, to archive all your data, you need a database. And uh, I want to present you our database which is called MouseDB uh, which we are using also for the, for the German Mouse Clinic and uh, just to give you an idea from the start screen, so you can see right there, these are the different rooms and the, the racks within each room, and you can see how many cages, how many cages are occupied, you also have, this is like a display, and you can click on each of these mouse racks and get a display uh, about the details of the rack. You can also click on a specific cage, and you can see how many mice are inside a cage, for example, right there. Uh, you can click, for example, at, at a single mouse, and you get information about every single mouse, about the date of birth, the earmark, the ID, age, genetic background, uh, mutation line, generation, whatever you need, whether they are in an experiment, what is planned with the animals, what they are for, um, um, and so on. And you have maybe also seen in the previous screen that we have right here a shopping cart. So you can put mice into a shopping cart and then see all the mice which are in the shopping cart and you can label any single mouse of the shopping cart and then say what you want to do with these mice. For example, if you click a, 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 a f um, female, as traditionally they are in, in rows, and the, the, the uh, males are in blue, so you select the male and the female and say you want to mate them. Put them in a new cage and then you start a mating, or whatever you want to do, uh, enter some genotype information or you want to kill the mouse, uh, then you can do this from the shopping cart, or you even label all the mice from your shopping cart and say, okay, kill all, all these animals. And then uh, it's, it's organized by the database. For sure, you would like to fi find mice uh, of a special um, situation you want to do. So we, ha we have uh, different uh, possibilities. The uh, simplest way is just to enter an ID and you can find the mouse or even a list of IDs and uh, search for the mice. You can go by cage, uh, by date of birth or interval of date of, of birth. The birth. You can uh, select for a special uh, mutant line or by genotype or whatever you need by experiment number and, and so on and can find the mice you're interested in. And in some cases you might even need to do a report of your mice. So this means we have a, a special section of predefined reports where you, for example 
uh, get the information about the experiments, about the uh, cohorts, about parameters, whatever you, you need. Uh, so these are predefined, you just click that right there and then you get a complete statistics about what is going on for this uh, question or just the, uh, uh, the, the tail count, snapshot count, just to know how many animals do I have in, in, in total. Okay. For sure you might be interested also in the ancestors of your mouse, so that's also no problem, you just click on the mouse and then go to the menu ancestors and you get the complete pedigree of your mouse, which for sure blows up quite, quite uh, quick. But uh, whenever you click on this mouse, you get the pedigree of, of this mouse, if you cl click on this mouse, you get, get the pe uh, former pedigree of, of uh, all the other mice. Uh, which method do you use to mark the animals? Uh, we are using ear clips. Ear clips. Yeah. Okay. The database also supports us in the, in the planning of our experiments. So, for example, we can put all the mice from a shopping cart for a special experiment, and then later on, when the experiment is uh, uh, should be done you can print out a complete list of these animals and uh, use this list to do your experiment. Or if you have a pipeline, as I mentioned yesterday, you can uh, see, for example, right here, the complete pipeline of uh, all your mice from this list. So for example, there are, this is uh, the, the date. Uh, I think it's a, a weekly interval. And these are the different uh, experiments that should be done with the mice and you can see exactly when which kind of experiment should be done with the mice and uh, as long as it is red it's not done if it's green the date uh, the mice are analyzed and the data is returned to the database so you know exactly okay i'm up to date with my analysis or there's still plenty things to do the database is also connected with our statistics program and uh, so this helps us, for example, to do all the statistics with our mice. So, for example, this is the data from the glucose tolerance test. If you're not familiar with this, so you do do an inject. This is a every part of this uh, graph is one single mouse. You can see so the uh, the green ones are the mutants, male mutants, uh, male controls, female mutants, female controls, and you can see exactly how the glucose after the injection. Um, increased and then decreased again to, to the normal value. You can see here the area under the curve, I think. Um, as a graph, we can also compare the data from a special mutant line with the data from for all former experiments and see whether the mutant line is still in the, in the normal range or whether, for example, in this case, the control animals are a bit... No, so the controls are in the normal range the mutants are, uh, are out, out of the range, which means, okay, this seems to be really an, an interesting phenotype because uh, it's not just a bit increased, it's really out of the range of all the other animals. And for sure you can do some statistics, um, uh, a table with, uh, with in, in this case, a linear model, analyzes with p-values, which ha helps to interpret the data. And... Uh, yeah, sure. When you do these experiments, uh, I imagine that you always put the, the control so the wild type, you know? Yes. But uh, what happens if you find that the values of the, of the wild type it changes in time? I mean, you put away the, the, the experiment or you still maintain it based on the fact that mm -hmm. anyway the you, linear model says that... You mean in, in this case? Yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of, of, of a quality control to see whether the, the, the controls still stay in the same level. If we have a time where there is a break and then the, the controls are on this level, then we know there must have been something changed. Okay, so you check, uh, you, you always maintain also, a, uh, let's say, a parameter to check the one type a long time. It's not just the uh, one type against the, the, the lineage you are testing. You also test the fact that one type has to maintain the same Yes, so if the, in, in this case, all the wild types, the control animals, are on the same genetic background, so we are able 
to, to compare these with all other wild types from the same genetic background. And then we can, can plot this. And then we, we really um, monitor al also this, uh, the, the background line from, from the controls. And uh, this is our quality control to see whether it stays stable. We know, for example, in some cases where, uh, where we had to, to switch from, from a different kit uh, for, for a chemical, uh, that uh, this uh, made a, a break in the level because uh, we, we couldn't buy the, the old one and had, had to switch to a new one, and, and this uh, made a break in, in our baseline uh, right there. Or if we switch to a new uh, machine, this might also uh, uh, cause some, some changes in, in, in the baseline. And the fact that you say that this uh, semi-automated uh, data analysis is because uh, I imagine that you have a program uh, uh, done in R, so you just put the value that it automatically creates all the stuff. E exactly. So uh, the good thing is we just press a button and it's already predefined which ones are the mutants, which are, uh, ones are the, co uh, the controls, and uh, the R just pulls out from the database the corresponding animals, and the data from these animals runs the statistics which is defined for this kind of test, and then presents the data. So that's really great. Okay. So nowadays also there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy to do. I think this is not just in Germany, but in, in many countries. Uh, so MouseDB also supports us to complete also this uh, animal, annual, uh, animal countings. So in Germany you have to, every year you have to, to present to the government how many mice you used for which kind of experiments. Yeah, I think so that's, that's uh, coming from European regulations. And uh, you also have to, in our case, you have to, uh, to use specific codes. And that's already organized by the system. You just press a button and you get all this information. That's also why on the whole campus in Helmholtz, Munich, uh, all institutes now use our system. And it supports us also for other uh, regulations like monthly countings or who is uh, responsible, who has a permission to do which kind of experiment. Um, or for genetically engineered uh, mice, you have to have additional information, so that's also <coughs> organized by the system. And the good thing for you is the system is open for everybody, so you can download the system and use it also for your facility. Okay, take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you should also take a picture from the next one. Because just downloading the system is not enough. Um, it's really a, a, a complex system, so you need a, a Linux server. You need also a person who is skilled with Linux, MySQL, and shell scripting. Um, and uh, maybe also a Perl developer um, if you want to adapt it to your needs. Because for sure, it's adapted for the needs in the German mouse clinic. It's adapted for the German regulations. Maybe you have to adapt it also for your country's regulations or your specific ideas you want to store in this database. So there are already many uses where we know that they use them. Maybe there are more. Uh, we are not uh, aware of all them. So uh, feel free to use it if you are interested in it. And I think that's all I prepared for today. Thanks for